Well, yesterday a, a movie was introduced nationwide. It's called God's Not Dead, and it's from that movie. Now, I need to point out, we're not preaching from the movie or uh, even the theme of the movie, but we're uh, inspired by the movie to preach a series coming up here on answering the objections of those who would challenge that maybe God is dead after all, that there is no God, and that uh, what we're doing is, is just chasing after fairy tales. And so we'll uh, be uh, going through some of the uh, um, same issues that the storyline goes through. But without giving away too much of the story, there's a college student is the hero of the story, if you will. His name is Josh Wheaton. And he has his faith challenged by his philosophy professor, and he must defend God's existence before the very class that he's entered. The uh, experience challenges his relationships. It challenges his faith with God. And it does so in a series of three debate sessions with the professor. So let's take a peek this morning trailer. You prayed and believed your whole life and here you are. Explain that to me. What do you say to people that are offended by your show? Because you pray to Jesus in every episode. If we disown him, he'll disown us. When a 12 year old watches his mother dying of cancer, a God who would allow that is not worth believing in. Life is really a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury and signifying nothing. Name? Uh, Wheaton. Josh Wheaton. Philosophy 150. You might want to think about a different uh, instructor. Come on, man, it can't be that bad. Think uh, Roman Coliseum. People cheering for your death. I'm Professor Radisson. This is Philosophy 150. I would like to bypass senseless debate altogether and jump to the conclusion which every sophomore is already aware of. There is no God. All that I require from each of you is that you fill in the papers I've just given you with three little words. God is dead. Mr. Wheaton, is something wrong? I can't do what you want. I'm a Christian. If you cannot bring yourself to admit that God is dead, then you will need to defend the antithesis. I think of Jesus as my friend. You think Jesus is God? I don't want to disappoint him. So your acceptance of this challenge may be the only meaningful exposure to God and Jesus they'll ever have. But to me, he's not dead. I don't want anyone to get talked out of believing in him just because this professor thinks they should. Mr. Wheaton, are you ready? We're going to put God on trial. Do you think you're smarter than me, Wheaton? Do not try to humiliate me in front of my students. In that classroom, there is a God. I'm him. This experiment is over. You get to decide who the most important person in your life is. Me, Professor Radisson. But I have to do this thing. Like it's something that God wants me to do. I, I can't just turn away from it. You just want to ensnare them in your primitive superstition. What I want is for them to make their own choice. That's what God wants. You have no idea how much I'm going to enjoy failing you. Yeah, but who are you really looking to fail? Me or God? Unfortunately, though, as we watch this film trailer and we consider the, th the plot of the story, the story is not that far-fetched and it is extremely relevant to today. Three years ago, uh, Michael Deaney, a biology professor at Tex Texas Tech University, posted a statement on the university's website claiming he would no longer write recommendation letters for students applying to graduate or medical school who would not sign a statement fully accepting a neo-Darwinian evolution. And it's not just students. A jury this, just this last week, on Thursday, found that the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, retaliated unconstitutionally against one of its outspoken Christian professors. Dr. Mike Adams was hired by UNC Wilmington as an assistant professor in 1993. The criminology professor was an avowed atheist at the time, but became a Christian in 2000. His conversion impacted his view on political and social issues, and these are topics that he addressed quite frequently in opinion columns. The jury decided that Adams was subjected to, quote, intrusive investigations, baseless accusations, and a denial of promotion to full professorship, despite scholarly output surpassing that of almost all his colleagues, simply because the university disagreed with his views. Now, this movie will introduce some, some powerful moments and lessons and it asks some tough questions that may seem to trouble, uh, be troublesome for Christians. Today, we're beginning a series of messages looking at some of these questions that all of us need to be able to answer. Now, why do I say all of us need to be answered? Because Peter admonished us to do so. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. 
Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now this series is designed to help the average believer, to empower the average believer, to understand the thought processes of the, of the skeptics and the unbelieving world around them, and how to lovingly address them. And that's key, as you saw in that verse. We need to, to love them with gentleness and respect as we share the belief within us. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Notice the scripture there. It says, demolish. This means that the truth will have the kind of impact of, uh, on the deception and misinformation of the skeptical age that we would expect with the word demolish. Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. And as we as a church, as we embark on this important series, God is not dead. We, we need a foundation of sorts, some, some of the historical drama that has contributed to get us to this place where we are in this country today. The first one we look at is, is Charles Darwin. The scientific world was overturned in 1859 by his radical theory of evolution through natural selection. Darwin proposed that all of life arose from a common ancestor completely by natural processes. Why is that so big? Because it bypasses the need for God. There's no question the world was changed by the presentation of this theory. It provided another possible uh, explanation, a plausible possible explanation other than a supernatural agent for how life came about. It's important to remember that evolution, however, only tries to explain what happens after you get life. It can't tell you how life began. And then there's Friedrich Nietzsche, 1883. He, uh, uh, he's a German philosopher who shared in, in several of his publications, God is dead. He wasn't saying that God had actually died, but that the idea of God was now dead. And with it, all the moral restrictions that went with that faith he was well aware of the connection between belief in God and our morality. And I was looking across for uh, uh, graphics for this uh, presentation, and I saw this one. I couldn't pass it up. It, it points out that uh, God is dead, said Nietzsche in 1883. Uh, Nietzsche is dead, God said in 1900. I thought that was apropos for considering his expectations. And then we have the scientific discoveries after that gave the false impression that God wasn't necessary to explain our universe. Einstein's theory of relativity refined the way, redefined the way we understand the big picture of time and space. Quantum theory revolutionized the, our, our picture of the subatomic world. At the smallest level, particles don't seem to follow the same cause and effect rules of the larger world of planets. Then, of course, there was the famous Big Bang Theory prevailing view of the time was that the universe had simply always existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. That was the prevailing thought. And then this discovery told us that there was an absolute beginning of space and time. All of these things added to the feeling that science was now giving us the explanations we used to go to religion to receive. By the 1960s, this skeptical worldview had become entrenched into the academic circles of our day, which prompted to, uh, Time magazine to ask on its cover of Easter of 1966, Is God dead? Atheism, though never officially more than 5% of the American people, has affected the view of reality of many Americans, as well as the laws of our land of late. Then came, of course, September 11th. 11 brought all kinds of theories and, and philosophies about what had happened and how we responded. A surge of books that condemned religion as the, as the reason for the attacks came out. Men like Richard Dawkins, a biologist from England who wrote The God Delusion. The late Christopher Hitchens, his work was called God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. Sam Harris called for the end of faith. Bill Mayer said religion must die. It's not enough to say we want a, a, a chair at the table. We want to be at the table as well. Now they need to point out neo-atheists or new atheists believe that religion is evil. Religion is what is destroying this world and it must cease. All of these types of writings demonstrate that skeptic extremism is just as prevalent today as religion 
and religious extremism. Now, for the most part, the average churchgoer, you and I, we go along unfazed by books like these. We just don't buy them. And if we don't buy them, maybe they'll go away. Where the impact is really felt, however, is among our young people. Through these kinds of books and atheist blogs and YouTube channels, young people are getting assaulted by their peers with questions and accusations against God and the Bible that they are just not prepared for. The negative impact on the church today is undeniable. For example, in 2007, millennials, those are the age, age group of 18 to 29, they were asked in a survey, do you ever doubt the existence of God? 83% said no, they don't. Five years later, just five years in 2012, they were asked the same question and 68% said no. It was a change of 15 points in just five years. This is happening because we're not giving believers the discipleship and training they need. You know, we focus a lot on evangelism, and so we should. God calls us to, to share our world, to share our belief with others. But notice in, in Matthew 28, 19, the, the Great Commission, which is where we get the call to go out and evangelize. It doesn't say go and share the word. What does it say? It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's not enough to tell them about Jesus. We also have to share with them the discipleship techniques that Jesus taught in the Scriptures. Young people, and everybody for that matter, are going to need more than just an experience if they're going to withstand the skeptical onslaught that awaits them once they leave high school. Scratch that. As they enter high school for some folks. You know what's really tragic? Out of all of this is that the evidence for God and the truth of the Christian faith is overwhelming. While much of the skeptical challenges are baseless and even absurd, and yet we decline to address them for fear that we're just not up to the challenge. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of those challenges. For the most part, while there are many reasons a person may doubt the existence of God, they normally fall into three groups or, or categories, if you will. There are lots of reasons. I've talked to a lot of atheist friends of mine, and they've come up with a, a, a treasure trove of, of op options and oppositions. But they break down into three groups. Number one, there's no evidence, they say, that God even exists. Number two, that science, specifically evolution, disproves God's existence. And number three, the problem of evil. Why would a God allow evil and suffering in our world? And this is the topic we're going to dis consider during the balance of our time together this morning. How many times have we heard someone say, a God who would allow horrible tragedies to happen to innocent people is not a God that I want to worship. How can a loving God allow innocent people to be hurt so badly? And it's a very fair question that can leave even the strongest believers scratching their heads. In the film, Josh quotes C.S. Lewis regarding such pain. C.S. Lewis said, Evil is atheism's most potent weapon against the Christian faith today. St. Augustine said this many, many, many years ago, If there's no God, why is there so much good in the world? And if there is a God, why is there so much evil in the world? The unbeliever must explain the presence of good in the world, but the believer must explain the presence of evil as well. Epicurus was one of the earliest philosophers to our, articulate the argument. He said this, God either wishes to take away evil and is unable, or he's able and he's unwilling, or he's neither willing nor able, or he's both willing and able. If he's willing and unable, he is feeble, which is not in accordance with the character of God. If he's able and unwilling, he's envious, which is equally at variance with God. If he's neither willing nor able, he's both envious and feeble and therefore not God. If he's both willing and able, which alone is suitable to God, from what sources are then evil, or why doesn't he remove them? See, skeptical philosophers reason this way. It's called a, a syllogism. It's a series of logical steps. A good God would destroy evil, they say. An all-powerful God could destroy evil. Evil, however, is not destroyed. Therefore, there cannot possibly be a good and powerful God. And on the surface, to someone who's experienced some form of tragedy in their life, this would seem logical. And for some of us, maybe we've, we've questioned or doubted that very thing. After all, if God were good and all-powerful, wouldn't it stand to reason that he would destroy the evil that plagues our world today? Here's a, here's a pivotal scene from the movie God is Not Dead. 
Now, it's been said that evil is atheism's most potent weapon against the Christian faith, and it is. After all, the very existence of evil begs the question, if God is all good and God is all powerful, why does he allow evil to exist? The answer at its core is remarkably simple. Free will. God allows evil to exist because of free will. From the Christian standpoint, God tolerates evil in this world on a temporary basis so that one day those who choose to love him freely will dwell with him in heaven, free from the influence of evil, but with their free will intact. In other words, God's intention concerning evil is to one day destroy it. Well, how convenient. One day, I will get rid of all the evil in the world. But until then, you just have to deal with all the wars and the holocaust, tsunamis, poverty, starvation, and AIDS. Have a nice life. <laughs> Next, you'll be lecturing us on moral absolutes. <laughs> but why not? Professor Radisson, who's clearly an atheist, doesn't believe in moral absolutes. But his course syllabus says, he plans to give us an exam during finals weeks. Now, I'm betting that if I manage to get an A in the exam by cheating, he'll suddenly start sounding like a Christian, insisting it's wrong to cheat, that I should have known that. And yet, what basis does he have? If, if my actions are calculated to help me succeed, then why shouldn't I perform them? For Christians, the fixed point of morality, what constitutes right and wrong, is a straight line that leads directly back to God. Oh. So you're saying that we need a God to be moral, that a moral atheist is an impossibility. No, but with no God, there's no real reason to be moral. I mean, there's not even a, a standard of what moral behavior is. For Christians, lying, cheating, stealing, in my example, stealing a great I didn't earn are forbidden. It's a form of theft. But if God does not exist, as Dostoevsky famously pointed out, if God does not exist, then everything is permissible. And not only permissible, but pointless. If Professor Radisson is right, then all of this, all of our struggle, our, our debate, whatever we decide here is meaningless. I mean, our, our lives and ultimately our deaths are no more consequence than that of a goldfish. <laughs> this is ridiculous. So after all your talk, you're saying that it all comes down to a choice. Believe or don't believe. That's right. That's all there is. That's all there's ever been. The only difference between your position and my position is that you take away their choice. You demand that they choose the box marked, I don't believe. Yes, because I want to free them. Because religion is like a, it, it, it's, it's like a mind virus that parents have passed on down to their children. And Christianity is the worst virus of all. It slowly creeps into our lives when we're weak or sick or helpless. So religion is like a disease? Yes. Yes, it infects everything. It's the enemy of reason. Reason? Professor, you left reason a long time ago. What you're teaching here isn't philosophy. It's not even atheism anymore. What you're teaching is anti-theism. It's not enough that you don't believe. You need all of us to not believe with you. Why don't you admit the truth? You just want to ensnare them in your primitive superstition. What I want is for them to make their own choice. That's what God wants. You have no idea how much I'm going to enjoy failing you. Yeah, but who are you really looking to fail? Professor. Me? Or God? So how do we explain evil happenings that cause tragedies like Columbine, the tsunami in Japan, the typhoon in the Philippines, constant famines in Africa, young men and women killed in senseless wars, terrorist bombings that cripple and maim, fatal car accidents, infant deaths, the Holocaust, and, and maybe closer to home, a loved one dying of cancer. Now, sometimes we, we think maybe if it were cheaters or child molesters or crooks that brought God's judgment, but why do innocent people have to suffer and die? Again, most, if not all of us, have asked this question when we've been faced with pain and suffering and tragedy believers and unbelievers alike. Recently there was one large survey of Christians and it, it said if you could ask one question of God, just one question, what question would it be? Overwhelmingly the answer was why is there still pain and suffering in this world? 
philosophers and theologians call the endeavor to overcome this process. It's called theodicy. Theos means God and dyke, the root of the word for justice. A theodicy is an explanation of how God can be just or, or how God can be righteous. It's a defense of God's righteousness in the face of the presence of pervasive sin. And so I want to give you what I believe is a biblical theodicy, a, a biblical defense of God who is holy, who is loving, who is all-knowing, who is all-powerful, and how he has allowed evil to dominate his creation. Two things I have to point out first before we get going into this. Number one, while the neo-atheists would like to lay claim to the idea, this issue has plagued mankind for millennium. It has been a problem for a long time, and I'm not going to insult your intelligence by uh, offering a simplistic platitude. I certainly won't pretend to know everything there is to know about the subject, but I do want to share a perspective that I've found helpful in looking at this very issue. Secondly, there are two very different perspectives when we discuss this topic. If you're going through pain, if you're going through suffering, if you're dealing with tragedy in your life, now any answer like this will only seem to be not enough, missing, almost a platitude. An oncologist looks at cancer quite differently from a patient who's been told she has six months to live. There's a big difference between being a spectator and one who's directly involved. The time to study the problem of, of pain and evil and suffering and an all-good, loving, powerful God is before you are in the tragedy, not while you're in the midst of that tragedy. Uh, tragedy. And I, I would not want to compound anyone who's feeling uh, issues like that today. But I do want to, again, discuss the topic as it needs to be discussed. First of all, we really need to define the word evil. And at first blush, we might think, well, that's kind of odd. I mean, everybody knows what evil is. But sometimes the statement is like this. It says, if God created everything and evil is a thing, then God purposefully created evil. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? There's only one problem. One of those two premises on which the conclusion is based is totally wrong. Evil is not a thing. St. Augustine defined evil as a privation of a good even to the point of complete non-entity. In other words, evil is where you would expect good to be, but it's not. This is not to suggest that evil doesn't exist. There's a group of, of uh, one religion that uh, tries to portray that, that evil is an illusion, it's, it's, and it's a figment of our imagination. I'm not saying that at all. Rather, evil exists the same way that dark or cold does. Dark is very real, but it is not a thing. It describes what? The absence of light. Cold is very real, but it describes what? An absence of heat. Here's another one for you. Have you ever eaten a donut hole? And I don't mean those round things that taste so good that they call donut holes. Have you ever actually eaten the hole in the middle of a donut? You cannot. It doesn't exist. It's merely the absence of the donut dough itself. Once the donut material has been eaten, the donut hole ceases to exist. The same goes for shadows. A shadow has no existence on its own. You never see a shadow on the ground and say, oh man, some guy ran off and left his shadow again. It goes together. A shadow is merely the absence of light caused by something that's blocking that light. Professor Norman Geiser has an interesting one on this too. I like he, he used the analogy of rust. Rust does not exist on its own. It is a part of the metal. The same is true with evil. It does not exist on, it own, on its own. It is a part of our human makeup. But you know, this means evil is not only a problem for believers in God. It's a problem for the unbeliever as well. In order to consider something evil or bad or, or even unnecessary, one must presuppose there's a moral standard by which those things are deemed evil. In fact, evil's only evil when it's compared to something that's not evil. As Josh mentioned in his debate response, the idea of evil is a, uh, a God-born concept. With no God, there is no such thing as evil. No need for it. Paul Coban writes, The problem of evil presents a question not only for the person trying to give an answer to the problem, but also for the questioner. When you define evil, you can define it in a couple ways. It's either the absence, the lack, or the corruption of goodness, or it's a departure from the way things ought to be. Either way. They both point to God whose character is the very standard of goodness and who's the designer 
of the universe. So now we've defined it. How do we explain its very presence? Could it be that God's not really a good God? Well, let me read from Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is, what? Good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Many other verses tell the goodness of God. In fact, the whole Bible is an outline of God's goodness in his dealing with man from Genesis to Revelation. Well, could it be then maybe he's just not all powerful? I don't think that's true either. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. I would think you could call the creator of the universe pretty powerful, don't you? By the way, did you know there are some things, however, that God cannot do? Now, wait a minute, Lawson. You just said he's all-powerful. There can't be things that God cannot do. But there are a few things he can't do. For instance, according to the book of Numbers, God cannot lie. According to the book of James, God cannot be tempted, nor can he tempt people to sin. In other words, God can't do anything out of his character. The reason God can't lie is because he is truth. The reason he cannot sin or tempt to sin is because he is holy. He is pure. He also cannot make logical contradictions. He can't create a square triangle, for example, or make what is false become true. He can't, as some would suggest in a a, a sarcastic way, he can't make a rock so big he can't destroy it because it's a logical contradiction. He can't make logical contradictions. So what do we make out of all this? God is good. He is all-powerful. He can perform any and all things within his character, and yet we have evil. Why? Listen closely to this next sentence because it forms the basis of our answer this morning. God could not eliminate evil without eliminating the possibility of accomplishing other goals that are also important to him. That's a mouthful and it needs to be spoken through again. Watch carefully. God could not eliminate evil without eliminating the possibility of accomplishing other goals that are also important to him. The Bible says that God created us humans in his own image, capable of having and sustaining a personal relationship with him. But it's impossible to create a free world with free choice without the option to sin. Otherwise, it wouldn't be free choice, right? But creatures who are free to love God must also be uh, free to hate him and ignore him. And when people act in ways outside the will of God, great evil and suffering is the ultimate result. God is capable of destroying evil, but not without destroying human freedom along the way. So perhaps the reason God doesn't yet destroy evil is because he'd have to destroy us as well. There are some other biblical suppositions to remember as we consider how we respond to this matter of evil and suffering. Number one, evil is real and people are blinded by their sin. Ephesians 2, 1 says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Now you may say, no, come on, most people are are good, are naturally good, right? No, people are selfish, people are mean, people are spiritually dead. Doubt it? Just go in L.A. during rush hour traffic. We are selfish individuals. We're mean. We're spiritually dead. Think of it this way. When any one of us looks at a family photo, who do we look for first? Ourselves, right? We look for us in the picture. Why do we all have locks on our cars and our homes if people aren't mean and selfish and spiritually dead? Policemen carry guns. Metal detectors are everywhere. There's murders every day in the news. We are a mean and selfish and spiritually dead people. Evil is real, sin is real, and mankind is infected with a self-centered nature. That's who we are. Supposition number two, there is no innocence. We are all guilty. In Awana, we learn verses like Romans 3.10 and 3.23. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. An old adage says, nobody's perfect. And that kind of sums up our fallen condition today. We're all guilty before a holy God. None of us are innocent. Everyone has broken one of God's law or more. And as James says in James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. You know what I find ironic? 
We as a people have broken his holy laws. We've ruined his paradise. We've thumbed our noses at him. And yet when tragedy strikes, we ask why he allowed it to happen. God has given us the free will to do anything we want to. And when we, then we turn around and we ask him why there's so much bad in the world. Supposition number three. His ways are higher than our ways. Isaiah 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declared the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Here's the, what's called the free will defense. and We saw it earlier. It suggests this. There is an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-benevolent God who created human beings as free moral agents, able to choose either good or not good or evil. Number two, because God is all-knowing, he knew evil would result Because he's all-powerful, he could create the world in a multitude of ways, but he is all-benevolent, he is all-perfect, he is all-holy. Therefore, he could only have good reasons for making the world in just the way he did. As a result, God may have created the potential for evil, but human beings, the ones that choose the evil things, they made it actual. But this actualizing of evil didn't take God by surprise either. So ultimately, there's evil in the world because God has a good reason for its existence, at least for now. We can't explain the why of God's ways. If we could, we'd be God. But A.W. Tozer comes close when he says, all of God's acts are done in perfect wisdom, first for his own glory, and then for the highest good of the greatest number for the longest time. And all his acts are as pure as they are wise, and they're as good as they are wise and pure. Not only could his acts not be better done, a better way to do them could not even be imagined. An infinitely wise God must work in a manner not to be improved upon by finite creatures. His ways are higher than ours. Jason Malik, as I was researching for uh, this morning, Jason Malik told uh, of a situation in his own life that he had seen the principle at work. When his eldest daughter, he wrote, when my eldest daughter was nine weeks old, she was diagnosed with a rare lung disease which required immediate surgery to remove the defective lung. In preparation for surgery, the doctors requested an MRI, which would enable them to operate effectively. Well, as you can imagine, a nine-week-old baby isn't going to respond to instructions to lie still during a 20-minute scan. So I had to stand over her, pressing her shoulders into a cold, hard metal table while the machine did all of its noisy work. It was a painful 20 minutes. And I could only imagine the thoughts going through Cassie's mind. Daddy, why are you doing this? You're hurting me. Please stop. But if I'd obeyed the look in her eyes and the message that they sent, if I relieved her her, of her temporary pain that I was causing her, she would have died within days. I knew more than Cassie did about her circumstances and desired truly good things for her, not just temporary relief or pleasure. See, if God knows more about our circumstances than we do, and desires only good things for us, perhaps he also uses painful circumstances to better ends than we could ever see or imagine. Supposition number four. Suffering can lead to our repentance. If you're a Christian, times of trouble can bring you closer to God. James says that it can be training ground and character of faith to trust him more. John says to be more holy by being pruned and transformed to be more Christ-like. 2 Corinthians says as a way to comfort others going through a problem just like you faced. And Romans 8 says that God even uses our suffering for his glory and his eventual good. 2 Corinthians 7 says godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. And Romans 2, 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, his forbearance, and his patience, not realize, realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? That's what he wants. Out of all this grand scheme, it's not so that you can, you can go to school, a certain school, or, or graduate and have a certain number of kids. He wants you to have a relationship with him. That is his primary target and goal for you. Sometimes breaking our hearts breaking our self-dependence helps us to see our need for him this is the biggest point of all suffering can result in our salvation which is his ultimate goal for each and every one of us suffering alerts us to our need for help a cure for our illness when it becomes so acute that it motivates us to go to the doctor and who but the great physician is the one that can heal us best 
pain drives us into his arms for solace and answers and for help. Being flat on our back as our last resort can result in finally looking up to him. Supposition number five. We need to consider God's past dealings in our lives. Romans 15.4 For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. In the Bible, certainly if you know your Bible at all, you know there are many recorded tragedies over which the people of that time must have wondered over this same question. Where is God when life is falling all apart around us? Think about Noah and the flood, the Egyptian enslavement of Israel, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., Joseph being sold into slavery, the murder of babies by Herod, even, yes, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. These were horrendous events that God turned around and used for what? The ultimate good of mankind. When we consider past tragedies in the Bible and how God uses our bad choices, we get a glimpse of how his purposes can result for our good. We get a peek behind the curtain, if you would, and see the creator at work. So while we cannot answer a why question about suffering, we can know that God has not revealed all of his purposes to us either. We only see dimly now, like a foggy reflection, but we can see enough of his ways through the revelation of Scripture to trust that he knows what is best for us. Despite the broken world, despite the broken lives we find ourselves in, we chose in rebellion to his will, by the way. And ultimately, what he wants more than anything else is for us to repent in order to have a restored friendship with us. Like the prodigal son, he wants to get, get us back and get us back home. Suffering can bring us to the point of acknowledging that we need his salvation, that we are not good enough in and of ourselves. And supposition number six, God's ultimate triumph. See, there's one as final aspect to all of this. Justice delayed is not necessarily justice denied. You know, many years ago, uh, when my son was 11, Matthew was 11, there was a young man named Anthony Martinez who was kidnapped, you may recall if you've been in the area long, kidnapped in the city of Beaumont. I felt a, an, a special pang in my heart because that little boy was 11 and my boy was 11. And so I joined in the efforts to pass out flyers and I don't know, I think I helped pass out hundreds and hundreds of flyers just myself and as did many, many other residents of the area. Fifteen days later, they found the naked mutilated body of Anthony Martinez near the city of India. Fourteen years later, they finally found the individual who had done this. Fourteen years. Justice delayed is not necessarily justice denied. See, I've read to the end of the book. I've told you before, I don't like to read novels. I don't have time to read novels. And so I like to read the first couple uh, chapters, I should say, and the last two chapters. Then I figured I got what the book's all about. And I can tell you, if you guys haven't read to the end of your Bible yet, God wins. There is an ultimate triumph to all of this. Satan and his deceptions will be done away with forever. And we will no longer be at the mercy of a world gone mad with evil, pain, and suffering because we will be in the presence of the Almighty God forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 20 says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And read this, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away he who was seated on the throne said I am making everything new and then he said write these down for these words are trustworthy and true amen and amen and finally supposition number six the gospel is the cure for evil 
Remember, atheism does not take away the pain of evil. They have to deal with the issue of pain just and evil as much as we do. What it does do is takes away our hope. Atheism only takes away our hope. The story of the Bible is from start to finish, the beginning and the end of evil, from Genesis to Revelation. First, God defined evil. He told us what it is and how to recognize it. Then he denounced evil. He tells us to stay away from it while we're still allowed the chance to choose. And then he defeated evil at the cross. Jesus Christ said, I have overcome the world. He defeated death. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He bore our sins in his own body at the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That, that's the gospel. That's the gospel message. What is the gospel? Gospel means good news. And that's the good news of Scripture. The good news is that God became man in Jesus Christ. He lived the life that we should have lived. And he died the death that we should have died in our place. Three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he truly is the Son of God and offering the gift of salvation to all who repent and believe that gospel. You know, I, I saw earlier uh, a cartoon with two turtles. And uh, one of them said, I asked God last night, I asked God about all the poverty and famine and injustices. I said, why, why don't you do anything about these things? And the other turtle said, you know, I, I would have asked God that, but I'm afraid he'll ask me the same thing. Today we've started a series as we look at challenges. Challenges about who God is. Whether God even exists. And it's an important thing to study as Christians because we need to have a reason for our faith. I would ask with you to join me now in prayer as we close out this morning's message. Father God, as we begin this series launch into some difficult questions about you, about our faith, about the very foundations of what we believe in. I pray that you will help us understand there's no need to fear the questions because the truth is greater than any of the accusations. We stand on a strong foundation. I pray that as we go through these messages that you won't create a contradiction but that you'll point out the the errors of the accuser's way that you will help us to have a stronger faith than when we started. That you will help us to see that you are the Almighty God and that we are your followers. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to learn more about your will, to learn more about your ways, to, to learn more about you. And it's in your Son's precious name we pray this morning. Amen.
He's late. 